to Hackers Gotta Eat. We're we'll talking about building a company around an open source project. And I'm going to slow down intentionally because I just want to talk fast, but I'm not going to. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no. There we go. Hello. That's what we just did. Uh, I'm Liam Newman. I'm a hacker. A uh, long time test and tools developer at Microsoft. Continuous integration proponent there, which at the time that I did it was like pulling teeth. It was like, no, really, if, if we test it earlier, you'll be happier. And the developer's like, no. And then the second you get, get, get it in place, they're, they, they're like, can you go do that over here now? Because I hate it over here without that. So anyways, uh, I'm a maintainer and contributor to a number of open source projects aside from Jenkins. I work as a Jenkins technical evangelist at CloudBees, which creates uh, enterprise uh, level plugins and uh, additions on top of Jenkins. Uh, so Jenkins was, was originally created by uh, Kosuke Kawaguchi. Uh, he was also a hacker, he created a, a little tool called Hudson uh, while he was working at Sun. Uh, that turned into Jenkins, eventually. Uh, he founded the Jenkins project, created a, his own company called InfraDNA after leading Sun, which then became Oracle. Uh, and uh, InfraDNA was uh, merged with CloudBees, and now he's the CTO, CTO of CloudBees. So Jenkins. Hudson, which then became Jenkins, uh, is an open source automation uh, server. It has at least 140, probably 150 now. I haven't updated it in the last month or so. 150,000 150, known master server instances uh, running on f controlling probably half a million machines worldwide, which helps over a million people implement continuous integration and continuous delivery for their projects and do all sorts of other things that are uh, uh, audit that they need to automate in their 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 uh, projects. CloudBees, as I was saying, uh, develops uh, a has deep uh, DevOps and uh, Jenkins experience. They <coughs> create an enterprise enterprise uh, level platform on top of Jenkins. They have expert support and uh, they're a major contributor to the Jenkins project. So let me just talk for a second here. So Kosuke created uh, Jenkins, and he found it really useful. It was a nice little tool, little server that he built in Java, had a web front end. Anybody, anybody here use Jenkins already? OK, a few people. If you don't know what Jenkins is, that's OK. I'll take a second to explain. Uh, it's like cron on steroids. Um, no. Uh, anyways, it lets you automate uh, and control any number of machines from a server um, and have a web front end uh, that helps you uh, get information, get reports on that, see how the jobs are going, and connect those jobs and launch other jobs based on that. General purpose automation tool. And he found it useful. He needed something that did this, and he made it. And uh, then it started, and he released it, you know, open source. And then it started to take off. And when I take off, I mean really take off. Uh, it, in January of 2010, there were 24,000 instances. In January of 2011, there were 36,000 instances. In 2012, it was 74,000 instances. So it just, do you have a question? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so there was obviously strong interest in the tool. And um, it, you know, it was being used by a lot of people. And more and more businesses were picking it up. Uh, it grow, grew in a sort of a viral fashion. Developer says, oh, this is really useful. They show it to their friend. Their friend says, oh, that's really useful. Um, and on it goes. Um, and then it becomes something that uh, teams use, and they build their processes on top of, and they depend on it every day, uh, day in and day out. So let's say, if you were Kosuke, you, you enjoy, I mean, he did this because he enjoyed doing it. and so. Let's say you really enjoy working on this project. Um, enlightened self-interest is why you started it. Um, and you know, you're solving your own problems, including where the mouse pointer is. <clears throat> so, 
you want to hand it over here? Hand me, the, hand me your pointer and I'll just... <clears throat> so altruism is great and being able to just hack on code because you like it, doing it is great, but it, you know, this is a side project that he had, that he had started and that, let's say, you had started. And what do you do now? Like, you're right, this, this project that, that you did just, you know, in your off time, come on in, come on. I know what you do now. Well, you know what I do now. Oh, you know what you, what do you do now? So, I, I know from other models that what um, people have done with stuff that they released open source and thought they were popular was that they um, sold themselves out to um, large companies who wanted um, special uh, things done with the tool. And they, they became the major developer for that tool for various companies. Uh, so the, then the indivi that individual that, person that becomes the, the major developer is, or the, that company does? No, the, the person that contracts themselves out. Oh, okay. As, as the developer of that open source tool mm. for people who want proprietary modules. Mm. For, for big companies that want proprietary modules. So that's probably the first place to start where you can, as an individual, say, great, I can work on this full time. But pretty quickly, though, it's just you. And at, at 74,000 instances, five years ago, six years ago now, that's, you're going to need more people pretty fast. And that means you're going to need to have some kind of business that, 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 you can, that will pay you and support you in being able to continue to work on this sort of thing full time rather than just doing it as a side project. So at going beyond the point of just being an individual, what, what are those businesses that you would create look like? What are, what's a business model that will give you a paycheck beyond and also give you more than just yourself working on it, which is, I mean, you can, I, I, I see where you're going. I, I see where you're going with that. There's, a, there's definitely a lot to be, uh, a lot to be said. I know a, a number of uh, companies that sort of individuals that, hey, I do this thing, and now you can pay me to do this thing for you, or you can use the open source version. Um, so, as a as a business though, um, with a business model, what does that look like? And you, for that, you have. When you look around, there are four general types of models that you're, that you're going to be talking about. Uh, professional services, enterprise products, uh, software as a service, or uh, support. Right? Those are the four basic areas. So I'm going to go over each of those. Um, the first one is professional services. You sell consulting, somewhat like you were talking there. Uh, at, at you, you sell someone that's going to go and write these things specifically, right? Um, and not just not just yourself, but you actually have a, a group of people, and that that means you know custom per company develop, de development on top of the project, but not just you. You actually leverage more people. Great. Um, the other, another option would be uh, enterprise products, where you um, build once and sell multiple times, right? Um, so in that case, you have products around the project uh, that aren't you know extensions of the project specifically, but they're they're related to it. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. You try to um, avoid reserving at that point when you're doing this sort of thing. You have to try and figure out how to re not reserve, you know, beneficial core features f just for um, your enterprise version. Uh, when you look at like MongoDB and Tengen, there's this sort of balancing act of like, oh, is this a core? Is this a core feature or is this not a core feature? And if it is a core feature, how do we, you know, do we? Can we reserve this for, for, if it's not a core feature, can we reserve it for enterprise customers? And then will the open source side of the house feel at that point that, hey, why are you reserving that? That's actually a core feature. And then you have know, this push, uh, push back, back and forth. Uh, you can end up alienating the community and making them feel like you know, all the good bits are uh, going to people that pay you rather than being open source. And then you're not open source anymore and you lose that, that dynamic. Um, the let's see here. The, mm -hmm. the problem here is that you can reduce the number of potential like, free users who can see a success from the project without paying you, and that's that 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 success, that being able to see success from the free side of things, is part of what drives uh, your this business model uh, for working. So uh, it can be problematic. The other side of this um, is that enterprise so software doesn't sell itself. 
you, 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 um, a lot of people will look at, hey, you have this open source product, product, um, uh, it's good enough, I'm done, and, they walk, and they, they, they're very happy with the fact that this one free thing works, and they don't uh, actually use your other, the other tools uh, that you have that actually uh, support you continuing to, to do this and, and support the business model. And you need a, sort of a critical mass, you need uh, features and stories that uh, compel people to uh, buy that product, and you are going to need you know, sales, a sales organization, and that's uh, not cheap. Uh, at the same time, you also have to make some choices around, do you sell this thing as uh, you know, a one-time, here's your piece of software, please enjoy, or do you sell it as a subscription model uh, with a number of seats per over a number of years and so on and so forth, and how do you, how do you structure that? So there's, there's questions to be answered there. Uh, another way, the, the, the third way that you can go here is uh, software as a service. Hey, we'll run this free thing for you. And that's great because we are an expert at this thing. We help build it. We know how to run it ourselves. You want us to support it. Um, the pros here is, I mean, it's easy to understand the, uh, what it is that you're offering. I mean, most customers, if they're running this thing internally and they, they're like, oh, this costs us this, this much, they can compare how much that is to what you're offering and, and uh, see the value right away. Um, and you also get economy of scale where you're running thousands of instances or more, where uh, and you make uh, more, you know, are able to be more efficient than someone who's running a single instance uh, of that server, for example. The cons are, again, people look at this and go, eh, I can run this on my workstation. I don't need your, your, your uh, software as a service solution for this. And it can easily spiral into, you know, people saying, great, you're gonna run it as a service, but you're gonna give me this one more thing, right? Uh, okay, and then this one more thing, and then this one, and you end up basically building them a custom version of the, you're back to the enterprise level, uh, uh, enterprise solutions again. So there are trade-offs in this area where you have to be able to um, sell the, the free thing as a service without um, ending up in the enterprise, in, in, in one of these other models, right? And finally, you have support, right? Uh, you provide experts as a service. They're here to help you. Um, the pros here is you, you know, larger organizations, you know, banks, all, all the people that, that, all the organizations that are, that have a lot of people that need this, need questions answered, see the value in this right away. They're like, great, please help, help, help these, help our 10,000 people understand how to use this thing. Um, the cons are that you need a bigger organization, again, much like the enterprise thing where you need sales. The same thing happens here, where you need, uh, you know, you need to have those experts, and you have to hire them, and you have to find, you have to find them, and you have to hire them. And where do they come from? And they're not always easy to find. Any questions so far? Thoughts? Cool. That's a good, good summary. Yeah, so far. exactly. <laughs> yeah. And of course, the answer, the, the the final answer is, hey, if you can do all of the above, great, do that. Um, if you can, if you can bundle them all and uh, make them all work and make progress on all of them, that gives you a degree of depth and breadth uh, of of your uh, income streams. That if one isn't working great right now, you have the other ones to back it up. Um, that has happened in some cases at CloudBees, for example, where they where they were offering so software as a service for a while and realized that they were not quite they weren't executing on it well and had had to sort of you know, step back from that to some degree. And can, but at the same time, they continued to offer their enterprise solutions, their software as a service, uh, not software, the, their support, um, and uh, I forgot the fourth one. Anyways, they continued to offer the other ones um, and continued to have a, a, an income stream from that while they've sort of gone back around to solidify that area. So you decided to, to build a company. You're gonna, you have your, your sort of your income stream model that you're going to, to, to use one or any number of these. Now you have to hire people. Um, since it's not going to be just you, which would be the, you know, the simplest process, but it's the next thing you have to do is hire, is find people, right? And where do you find them? Well, the first place, of course, with open source is you hire the people that are already doing this volunteer. It's fantastic. Um, hire your contributors. Uh, hiring from the project is 
fantastic because you can already see who, you know, like, this person's been working on this a lot. I already know what their work looks like. I already work with them most likely. Um, they're, they're doing pull requests, they're, doing, they're giving feedback, they're on the, the mailing list of talking to other customers. Great, I, it's, very, it's very straightforward to find who is, oh, this person's motivated and they're qualified, let's go. Um, open source developers already, we already know how to work together, um, hopefully. Uh, and employment developers give us more time to you know, solve the big problems. If these people are doing you know, 10 hours uh, a week, or 10 hours a month, and you give them 40 hours a week to work on this thing that they're doing, that they feel passionately enough about, uh, they, now, they, now, they now can do full time, they can produce some really great stuff. Um, at the same point, hiring these people often brings in sales leads, where they were, wherever they were just working, <laughs> is probably, and they were working on your, your, uh, on your project uh, as, as a side thing, they were probably doing it uh, in their spare time because they were using it at that work, and their old business just lost somebody that they really valued. And what do you know? They probably could use your help. Um, it's, a, it's not necessarily the nicest thing to say, but that's, that's business. Um, the cons of hiring from the project is uh, you can, it can cause an ambiguity for those developers. I mean, they were doing this thing on their own time, some amount, and now they're doing it full time. So when you tell them, no, I, I need you to go work on this thing, on this part of the project, they, are, they, are they still going to be as passionate about that? Are they still going to be as interested? And the question is, is am I, you know, when they're doing this work, is it on their own time now, or on, is it my time, or, or company time, right? Um, and as I just said before, the, when the company wants you to do X and you want to do Y, um, who wins? The other thing that can happen is, uh, you can risk being the, the company that you start can be risk as co-opting that the open the, the, the project <coughs> as a whole. When in the most vocal employee, the most vocal contributors are now employees, they now can be seen as having a conflict of interest. They're, what they were saying before that was seen as oh, you care about this project, you're passionate about it, now can be seen as well. How do I know that you're not just shilling for the company? Um, by other people that are no that aren't part of the company at that point, but are part of the project and are important. Um, and you can the, the problem is you can remove otherwise active participants from the project. Yes. No jurisdiction. Okay. Yes. Will you give some ideas how to cope with these problems later? Uh, yes. I I'm trying to write all the slides, but yes. The, there's I can I can talk a little bit more about that. Um, so if you hire people and from the, the open source side of the house and you put them on, the enter, on your, your enterprise or your, your, your paid products, suddenly there's a, also, like this is the reverse of what we just saw in the previous where you're like, oh, you get lead, sales leads from this. Well now you've actually taken somebody who was working on your open source project and put them on your paid project, which means now that open source project has a hole of, of someone that, that was passionate and was working on it. And, um, to answer your question, you know, what do you do about these? Um, some of them are just it's, just, it's more that you need to think about them. Like there isn't like, oh, there's one right answer, right? It's okay, so the enterprise side now still has to make money and still has to work, and the open source side has to work. So where do you, where do you, where do you come down on that? You have to, but you, the most important thing is to be aware of it and to pay attention to it, to say, okay, this is something that, that, that we still have to make sure that that the open source project continues to live and, and do well. Um, <coughs> and this would be what we were talking about. So you're talking about interacting with the project. Um, the key, one key thing is to define the boundaries within the company for interacting with the project. Make, you know, make sure that the company is on the same page before spinning cycles in the project. Um, one of the things that I do uh, a lot, uh, there's a, there's a a tendency within CloudBees, people just talk as we. We, we, we want to do this, we want to do that. And the, somebody in just about every meeting, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the Jenkins technical evangelist, so I'm, it's often me going, which we are you referring to? Or do you mean we CloudBees? Do you mean we Jenkins? Which, which we? And by sort of uh, framing your discussions in terms of that, that helps 
clarify what hat someone is wearing, basically. Um, and that's, that. again, you can have both sides, but you just need to be, uh, think clearly about, okay, I'm putting on my Jenkins hat, and I'm thinking about it this way, and then, okay, I'm taking off the Jenkins hat and um, putting on the Cloud Bees hat and, and looking at it from that perspective. Um, and at least in person when I've done this uh, at like Jenkins World or something else, when people ask me, how do I do this in Jenkins? And my answer has to be, well, there's a Cloud Bees plugin for that, right? There's a Cloud Bees feature for that. I basically go, I'm going to step out of the Jenkins booth. <laughs> and people respect that. They're like, okay, I get it. You're, you know, you're not trying to sell me on it. You're just saying, this is, this is the, the, an this is the answer, the first answer that I would give, but it's not necessarily the one I would give as, a, as the open source side of the house, right? Um, and the other, other, you know, key thing to do is to make sure that you respect the community and you make that, as the company, make sure that it's very clear that you're, that you respect them and that you accommodate, you know, community feedback as you uh, make choices. Um, and basically that, that's that, that continuing sort of boundary is, is what you have to keep being atten uh, attentive to. Um, So you have development collaboration going on between uh, the enterprise side of the house and the open source side. Um, the, it's best to follow the, the, the Red Hat model and work upstream as much as possible, upstream being the open source side of, of things. So um, where possible, uh, this again comes back to answering that same question of like, well, how do you split this out? Well, try it, does it make sense to, to make it free? Is there any way that we can make it, make it part of the open source project? Then we should do that. If it, if we can if if there is if there isn't a way that we can then okay but pushing that stuff upstream into the general availability um, makes it easiest for everyone to be involved right up, um, use in this in the case of Jenkins use the Jenkins side of, of the repositories use upstream repositories manage backlogs in upstream issue, issue trackers such as so for Jenkins there's a Jenkins Jira Cloudbees has its own Jira internally but where possible, the, the, the bugs get filed externally as much as possible, right? So that, the, so that if someone comes along uh, from outside the company and uh, wants to work on that, they can, right? Um, and, it, and as much as possible, the, the issues live out there. Um, and then only the you know, cloud be specific uh, issues live internal. Um, and cloud the, the the people that have worked on the project and been hired by CloudBees, for example, uh, follow the, 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 the Jenkins practices for pull requests and stuff like that. They, they, they don't have any special standing in the, uh, the, the open source side of the house. They simply are contributors just like everyone else. Um, they're probably going to be major contributors because they get to do it full time, but they are still just contributors. And if someone else comes along and has as much passion and is, and is willing to devote the time, then they, they have equal standing. Right. Back in the beginning days of MySQL, there was a standing policy that, that encouraged the community to grow and at the same time it allowed it to become a MySQL AB. And that was the dual licensing concept. The developer came in, it was their code, but at the same time they signed a document that allowed the core of the MySQL to say we had ownership too. Hmm. As it grew, the ownership grew with it, more developers became involved, they got credit. But the determinations and decisions made by the group that formed MySQL in the company was possible because they had the license. Interesting. What about in Jenkins? How did that work? So in, in the Jenkins side of the, uh, in the Jenkins case, it's MIT license. Jenkins is, is MIT license as a whole. So by contributing, you are basically saying MIT license, which is free to reuse wherever. So it, CloudBees doesn't have any uh, special say to that at all, and n no one does, really, right? It's, it's, it's free to reuse and modify as long as you include the license, right? So, uh, yeah. I, there is a, a slide later on talking about licensing, and I am not a license expert. So, uh, it is something that's important, In I'll go into that in just a minute as to why, but, um, but as you say, that's one way of, of building it. This is a, a much more sort of um, it's a non-ownership in that respect. 
Um, it's so I think it, the licensing is a big deal because it distinguishes the difference of what MySQL is today as opposed to what Postgres is today. Fair, yeah, exactly. At the end of the day, it's about power. Yes, and I think I, I've, later slide I will say exactly that, so we'll continue. Um, Sorry. No, no, I, jump ahead. You, you, told them the, you told them the secret, dang, it's okay. It's okay. Um, so the, the last point here is, is figuring out how to determine transparency in, in that roadmap. So you have this, this open source project and you have a roadmap for that project and then you have your internal projects um, that are your enterprise product or whatever, um, and figuring out how to be transparent about why, okay, we need to do this here because this also needs to happen, and that, but this has value for making sure that you should, that, that value is explained to the community and it's part, that, that it does provide value. It isn't just like, well, we're doing a bunch of work here and you guys can suck it up. It's like, no, it's, this, is, this provides value over here and there's something else that we get out of it, right? Transparency in both teams? Um, Open source and enterprise team? Or code base, or whatever you want to call it. Or you have a single roadmap. Uh, there are separate roadmaps, right? The, there is, there are separate roadmaps, but but the same developers might be working on both sides of that that uh, dividing line. So, but is the transparency of the roadmap for both the enterprise and or definitely for the open source? Well, definitely for the open source because that's the yeah. that, that's that side right, where it's open community, right? Um, the from the internal side, that's uh, that's more about your your business as a, a specific, right? Um, but externally, that that external, the open source side of the house still has to behave as, as, and show value for these things on their own. It can't just be well. For instance, CloudBees is doing this because, well, yeah, we're going to use it, right? It's a <laughs> um, it's a right. Or that that uh, I think Microsoft had got bit by this several times, where they were like, "Well, we only," and this was not open source, but like they they would they did things that were specific to Microsoft, uh, like tying uh, Windows and and Office together, right? That's where they got sued, right? Where it was unfair competition. But in some ways, that 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 closed that was a closed source problem. But it was the the same thing would happen in the open source, where if you if you tried to create special hooks over here that weren't really usable by anybody else or they weren't understood, you'd run into that same problem. So it has you have to provide that open roadmap and have it actually provide show show that this is good for that open source project on its own. Right? Would a good word for that be a plugin, where you can just sell the plugin? And it plugs into the open source, or it plugs into the enterprise version. Um, that's what. That's a lot of what um, CloudBees has done. Oh, don't do that. It's okay. It's just water. Um, that's a lot of what CloudBees has done. They've created enterprise plugins. Um, Jenkins is a plugin model, so that there's a lot of that that does happen. Um, but um, GPL version two. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You obviously know more about this than me. <laughs> um, right, yeah, so you can't just have stuff thrown over the wall um, when it comes to the, to the open source side. Um, hey, there we go. I was, I, was, I was so close, I was so close. Um, so we're starting with branding and trademarks. Um, who owns something uh, being, you know, being recognized as like CloudBees? Okay, so, to be honest, I used Jenkins for four years. I didn't know who CloudBees was um, until maybe the last six months of that. When I went, oh, they wrote the folders plugin that I use. That's fantastic. Oh, it's free. Good, thanks. Um, but I did not know that, that uh, very much about them. And that still happens to me where, I, where as a Jenkins evangelist, I'm not too worried about it. Um, but where I say, oh, yeah, I work for, I, I work for CloudBees. And people are like, who? I work on Jenkins. Oh, Jenkins. Oh, OK. So there's, there's, it, it's good to be seen as the expert in this thing, but um, it can be uh, a bit of a shadow to come out from under sometimes to make sure that that's, that you're, as, as your company, that you're visible, right? Um, but it is also how people will perceive the value. Once they make the connection, they're like, oh, you're the Jenkins people? Oh, good, thanks, please come help me. Um, speaking of power, trademark. <laughs> Who owns that trademark, for example? Jenkins, the Jenkins project owns its own trademark. 
Right. It does not, Cloud Peace does not own Jenkins. They don't own any part of it. They don't own the trademark. The, the Jenkins has its own board and its own you know, controlling interest in itself. Um, Cloud Peace has a lot to say, you know, a, a, lot, a lot of input, but that is not the same thing as being, as, ha as having ownership of it. Um, yeah, and you need to have clarity, and the company needs to respect the, the, the trademarks usage on, uh, for that open source project. Um, otherwise, again, you end up sort of losing what makes that project valuable. Licenses, yeah, licenses 101. Uh, so, comply with existing licenses, explain to employees, you know, copyright ownership. Uh, let's see here. You, as, as I said, you probably know way more about this than me. The license definitely can, as you say, determine the culture, of, uh, a large, have a large influence on the culture of the project as a whole, right? Who decides to uh, contribute to the open source project, who comes in and is interested in what they, you know, what they, they get from that, for example, in the case of... Uh, I'd like to liken the difference between GP, um, GPL and BSA licensing like this. GPL is evangelicalism. You're part of the community, but you must also evangelize. You must share, you must follow the code, you must follow the spirit. BSD is like an orchard. You walk by, you see the fruit, it's on the ground, you pick up, you keep on walking. And you don't have to contribute back. No. Right. The choice is yours. Right. And these, the, the choices, a lot of developers want to, you know, be, ah, legalese, run away, I don't want to know. Um, but it's important, as, as you say, it's important to actually figure this out early on, decide, and you know, understand what the ramifications are of that. I'm not going to go into all the details of it here. I'm just going to say, you, you need to pay attention to it. Okay, have you ever met Michael Tiemann? Uh, no. Michael Tiemann used to be the CTO of Red Hat. Okay. He was there at the very, very beginning. Michael Tiemann was also the one who created GCC. Okay. And he put a back door on GCC and then told everybody 20 years later. <laughs> um, one of the things, he believed a lot in licensing. He was actually one of the founders of OSI. So the idea of licensing really is a big deal. It's the spirit of it. And these were big questions asked and answered in Red Hat when it, at the very beginning when it started out. Okay. And I guess this also comes right into what I was saying, what, what the last point here, which is, you know, there's a difference between open source and free. Open source software versus free software. And, you have to understand the difference to, to when you as you're starting up. Otherwise, it'll come and it'll come back and bite you. So it's nice that that, that uh, you have companies that pay attention to this as they start. So, Isn't yeah. open source giving a little bit watered down as brand? Uh, what is it? This um, anytime you have something that that makes it into the public consciousness like this, it's going to get it's going to turn, right? Like you have the concept of DevOps, which is my current just like, because uh, um, every time now, the last two years I've uh, been to Jenkins World and I meet a whole bunch of DevOps engineers. Wait, what? That's the, it's like a contradiction in terms. Like if you're, if you're actually doing that, you're not actually a DevOps engineer. But, but, but because of the term being uh, what it is, it has sort of taken a turn from where it was originally intended, right? So, yeah, uh, it's possible that open source is, that, the con that, that term is getting opened, uh, sort of watered down over time, or it changes, right? But um, it still has specific meaning in some, in, in some of us. It doesn't, to some of us, right, exactly. And then, you know, the question is, why bother with all this? Um, uh, Open source is eating the world. That's, as you were just saying, like, isn't it getting watered down? Yeah, it's, it's getting watered down because it's everywhere. Um, I don't like the term it, uh, eating the world. That's why I put it up here twice. Um, it's everywhere is, is, is the point. And it, you know, more and more organizations are you know, seeing that open source is a, a better choice. It's, you, know, you get more flexibility, higher quality. Um, and it means that a lower uh, adoption, a lower barrier to, to adoption, it means that there's a larger, um, if you want to call it, the top of the funnel that that of people that may be interested in using a product that is built on top of whatever open source that is, right? So, um, 
Yes. The other thing that, that open source lets you do is it lets you solve more problems. Um, so, more problems, such as you just have more, more code, more features, you can do more things because um, there are you know, more people willing to work on the thing. But that also, it also extends beyond just code. Um, you have more people who will contribute documentation, more people who can communicate about something, more people who feel a sense of ownership um, and uh, participation and then are willing to do just little bits for you know, their, their friends or, or people that they know or even you know, strangers. The, you know, there's a very, the Jenkins IRC channel, the Jenkins mailing list, these are very active because people are uh, involved, right? And the, in my time at Microsoft, when I, when I, once I left, I suddenly was like, oh, this situation where at Microsoft I could never get enough help. I could never find anyone that knew about this thing. Um, the second I stepped out of that, that umbrella was like, oh, everybody knows about this thing, or at least there's another 100 people somewhere that know about it um, and that are interested in it because they, they're also using it. They're also working with it. They're also playing with it. And it's not just this one specialized thing that someone bought and then, can, and then feels like, well, I'm just waiting for the documentation to roll downstream for, for the money that I paid. Um, <coughs> you also, um, in, in terms of the open source, you get more infrastructure. Um, I have to look at my notes here for a second. You get more, more points of view also. That's uh, another point to be made here, where um, it's easy from within a company or within one, one closed source sort of situation to be able to say, oh, we, we do this and sort of uh, put on your blinders, whereas with uh, open source or a free open source project, you have people that will just come along and start using it. Mm -hmm. And the plus, uh, the, the downside is some of those people are, are like, oh, please, no. But most of the time, people that are interested are smart, and they're doing something interesting, and they're passionate about it, and that leads to different perspectives and, and things getting better overall. Um, there's a, it means that there's a constant sort of uh, challenge to your, to your business, which you would think would be bad, but it's actually really good, because it means that you can't just uh, say, well, we built this great thing, we're done, please pay us money. Because um, someone will come along and go, yeah, I can pay you, but I could also do something like that over here, or something related to that. And then you, as a company, have to start have to ask yourself, oh, well, what can we do better? Like you're, you're continually raising that the the open source side of, of the the open source project will continually raise the bar on what it is that you're doing as a business um, to pro to provide value to your customers. Um, and you have to find an area as a business that is um, not just, um, that's not competing with the open source project, um, which, again, you get to solve m more newer problems. Like, okay, well, we solved, we've, we've worked on this, now let's do this next thing because the, there's more to be done. Um, for, um, for CloudBees, it was managing, Jen it's been managing Jenkins at scale, which is, you know, high availability, Active Directory, some of those things uh, where you need where it's a hard problem to solve, and it's hard enough and interesting enough that people may go, oh, I can write that in two weeks. They can't. <laughs> um, they can, or they can, but then they're going to spend the next two years trying to figure out how to do it right. Um, so there's that, like, okay, so this, that, that was, that's been a very reasonable dividing line for, uh, and, and value proposition for CloudBees. Um, you can also solve better problems. Um, that's what I was shooting for. I had on my, my slides. Um, so this is what I was saying. Participation exposes these new things. Um, so you are always challenging yourself. And then you can solve bigger problems. So by having things being open, you can go and you know, organize a bigger community, have um, you know, security vul vulnerabilities, and work on larger you know, things. Um, and by starting this company, um, uh, so by starting a company, you can solve bigger problems. So um, what she was saying to begin with was like, why don't you, you know, as, a, as a consultant, I can do this one thing. Well, 
as, as a company, you can go and have this larger community. You can, you can execute on larger visions by having more people involved in the project um, that are actually also doing it full time. Um, in the case of Jenkins, the most recent one of those has been uh, Blue Ocean, which was a um, new user experience for Jenkins where Cloudbees um, contributed uh, a number of developers and designers to come up with a, uh, a new uh, UI and a new, new experience and a new way of using Jenkins that was m more friendly and more you know, targeted to what we saw as, uh, and by we I mean Cloudbees, uh, what Cloudbees saw as the, um, the way that people were using uh, Jenkins for continuous delivery and modern development, yes? So can, uh, so the community uh, participation at the open source side, I'll call it, mm -hmm. yeah. will that possibly drive the corporate enterprise? Yeah, and that's exactly what happened here, right? Oh, okay. the, the, well, so you now sell more services on top of what somebody else wrote or? Well, just, well in this case, what, what it was, was the Cloud B says, okay, well, uh, so Jenkins gets used for a lot of things. People have used it for managing labs and machines, but we all. But what Cloudbees found was that people were using it for continuous continuous integration and continuous delivery. And they said, "Great. Well, there needs the 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 UI for Jenkins has been pretty much the same for as long as it's been around six seven years. Things have advanced in that time. We need to invest in there being a, a better user experience." Um, to continue to serve that that uh, that need, and when people use Jenkins, and more people use Jenkins to do continuous integration and continuous delivery, and are happy with that, then more of them will uh, use that at larger companies, and then that's how, uh, and then they will eventually, hopefully, become Cloudbees customers. That's so Cloudbees invested in improving Jenkins um, specifically, without it being. Uh, without as a as the free side, specifically just the fr uh, the free product, they were not. It wasn't like okay, we're going to do this and have a point at which the. No, I'm basically saying the community could basically help you enhance your product beyond your vision, the original right. vision, exactly, and then actually enforce your dollars coming in. Ah, yes, that too. That too. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yes, and then of course, yes, the, because it's open source, the community can contribute to that and continue to give feedback to the des design and and right. and code and so on and so forth. Um, if you don't know Jenkins, this won't mean a lot to you. If you do know Jenkins, you'll go, wow, this is great. This is, looks like a modern UI, unlike where Jenkins has come from. So that's, um, uh, this is the uh, you know, modeling of the workflow in Jenkins. So you can see uh, stages being executed, and uh, this is a visual editor for your pipeline, for your continuous integration pipeline. All great stuff. Right? And so, ultimately, this benefits the project, right? Um, more people, and not just contributors, can move the project forward, um, designers, writers, and so on and so forth. And by having a company behind an open source project, not just one person, you know, I'm a consultant, I do this thing, uh, but having an actual company as a whole and, and uh, the support and those features in there means that um, Main Street businesses will treat that open source project with more credibility, right? So um, whereas uh, a bank might, if Jenkins were just an open source project without some sort of backing, might go, well, I don't know, we don't want to touch that. Um, the fact that there is a company behind it that will provide support if, it, if that, the, that open source project um, suits their needs gives, them more, gives the, the open source project more credibility as well. Um, and then Cloudbees, the presence of Cloudbees can also encourage other companies to contribute to the open source side as well. We've had that happen uh, more recently. Um, yeah. So open source is valuable. You know, people's time is valuable. And uh, what you do is you trade your time for, for getting paid. Um, and that's, I mean, it's a little bit cynical. Um, oh yeah, there's the classic, classic view of this, which is free software is only free which if, if your time has no value, right? So um, ultimately, you've you got to eat, and uh, this is one way to go about it. Questions? Thoughts? Discussion? <coughs> yes? You, you mentioned earlier, so you hire contributors from the open source community, and then you said their workflow is 
pretty much similar. They're still making pull requests and stuff. Yeah. So who's the who's the authority there to actually merge that in now? In the, at least that combines them. So um, from the Jenkins project side of things, um, it's the same people as it always was. There's there's the the, the community that, that controls the project, the okay. and so on and so forth. But actually, the, the contributors self manage that. Right. Okay. Right. Um, so it's just like the founding authors. And yeah. In the case of uh, in the case <coughs> of uh, Jenkins, the it Koske is still. Um, What's the term? BDFL? Benevolent uh, ben, uh, ben, 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 dictator, do I? Thank you, BDFL. <laughs> um, I can't say benevolent, but I got the rest of it. Anyways, um, and so it basically it's like, okay, you, you know, sort of guide this project as a whole, but you refrain from doing, refer, refrain from exercising that power as much as possible and okay. let people figure themselves out. But you still, like, I mean, there's more than one. So like a small group of people. Well, then there is there's a Jenkins board, yes. Well, not merge the. But in terms of the merge, in terms of the day to day like merging of stuff, code and and, yeah, and fixing the bugs, that's still you know a group of contributors. Okay. Right. And some of them work for work for Bobby's and some of them don't. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about uh, interacting with open source companies. I'm. I'm thinking in particular about, so there's there's two companies that I use their products, their open source products, mm -hmm. that I really love. It's HashiCorp and SaltStack. Okay. Um, and... Um, Hashi does... Uh, Terraform... Ah, oh, right, okay. Calls old calls. Um, I'm a fanboy of both companies. Okay. I'm using their open source stuff. They have enterprise versions of both stuff that um, my company's not. <laughs> not, not at the amounts that they're asking. For. Right. I totally want to give them money. I bet I could get my company to throw a couple thousand at them for like a bit of consulting or something. But that's not what they do. So the so way, the way I that actually, that I worry about the health of these companies. <laughs> well, you know, okay. So you can't, you can't, as as an individual hacker, even as someone with a company that you work for, that you have some pull at or whatever, you can't fix. It's the somebody else's company. You can't. Yeah. yeah. You as a, you as an individual or even an individual company is not going to pay them enough to to make them healthy or not, right? right. It's, it's going to be a bunch of. I think they are healthy, right? right now, exactly. But so just long term. So in terms, of, I can speak from the Jenkins project side of this, which is what recently we did. We uh, created a thing called the Jenkins Enhancement Proposal Process, which is a way for us to sort of uh, have a consensus design process where people can bring new ideas or, or bring. Uh, new features that they want to implement or that they want to see happen and contribute to the project that way. So one way that your company, like for example, for in your case, yeah, they don't, you can't get them to pay uh, pay for, you know, a couple thousand, maybe a couple thousand or whatever, but you can't get them to pay for the, the enterprise project. You can, however, get them to participate in the open source side. For example, Convince my supervisor that my next sprint is going to be doing a feature. Okay. Exactly, or even like one day a week for the next six months, or something, where it's where you're going to you're going to contribute. They're going to contribute by not by throwing cash at it, but by throwing time or uh, an attention. And you can also you know sell that to your company as we need this feature, we need this behavior. It's not in the open source side of this, and propose that. And in the case of the Jenkins project, uh, someone. Uh, from Prakna, I believe it is, uh, recently proposed a design for what this what's called configuration as code, which is configuring Jenkins, the server, the settings for the server when you set up, which is extremely popular. Everyone wants to do this. Um, and up until now, it's been done via the Jenkins CLI, which is a bunch of, you run a bunch of you know commands, as opposed to just having what the, the person from Prakna proposed, like, let's have a YAML file. That, that has all these settings in it, and we'll make a plugin that'll be open source, and it'll have this design, and we're gonna you know, commit to, to having the person that's at Brackman doing this one day a week for the next, I don't know exactly how long, but they, they were sort of like saying, here's the, here's the idea, and like, yes, please do that, you know, come, come in, please help. Um, and that, that sort of uh, behavior gives, also, I mean, it supports those companies because it means that you're improving their open source uh, product um, without necessarily having to get that budget PO approval. 
things. I have the exact project. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's possible in, I mean, you use an example, I know a little bit more like the Fedora Red Hat relationship mm -hmm. that the open source project goes in the direction that the co parent company may not be happy with. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that happens. I don't know if it's ever happened. I, you know, so there's, there's things that, um, Yeah, I mean, the, the, so the question is, uh, is, is there a case where the, the, these things can go in different directions? Yeah, they can. I don't think they can, as long as the company is... Prime participant in the open source. <laughs> Even, the, that would say, that would, that would be like, oh, because they're, they have so, so many people involved, they would have the most say. But it's not necessarily even that. It's more just like, I, I can honestly say this, from all the contributors that I know that work at CloudBees on the Jenkins project, they're not looking at, I don't... I don't see them making decisions like, oh, this is better for CloudBees, or this is better for, they, they're really, they go, is this better for Jenkins? Yes, okay, then we should do that. Um, and as long as that it holds true, it will ultimately be good for CloudBees. Um, otherwise, I mean, if it's the, the reverse is actually the worst, the, the worst case scenario, right? Where you do things that are good for the company, but bad for the open source project, and then things die. I don't know that I answered your question from earlier, so if I have I, I, I don't know, I have a new one. Okay. Um, in regards to the business model, you said um, you have this example with a bank and uh, a company backing the open source project. Imagine I am a bank, yeah, and um, I think, oh, Jenkins looks interesting, oh, but it's open source, and well, um, you know, open source never yeah, knows what's some, going on over there. Some, uh, some guys who sit at night, uh, they are not concentrated and they hack some code and who knows if this will work. Right. And you said um, a bank is, is happy if they know that a company is behind this open source project. But me as a bank, they, and you said it in the beginning yourself, I never heard of cloud bees. Why should I, in this case, well, that's um, what said. Why, why should this raise my level of trust in this software? Well, because so how, how do you manage to raise this level of trust? Well, okay. So for one thing, Cloudbees is, isn't just wasn't started yesterday, right? So it's it's uh, we've been around. Cloudbees has been around for years. We have a large number of banks actually that the, the, that are already involved that already use Cloudbees products and use Jenkins, uh, use Jenkins and the Cloudbees products on top of that. Um, and so that's partly where sales, sales and support comes in, where the salesperson would go and talk to them, or a support person would, would go with them and say, okay, what do you guys do? Um, yeah, we have these other customers that use us. Um, yeah. you have reference customers. Yes, yeah, so you have, re you have mm -hmm. reference at that point. So I mean, starting from zero, you don't so go to the banks, yeah. probably, right? You start from s someone that's, that's a little bit more, a li little bit less risk averse. But the other point to be made there is that the value proposition uh, that CloudBees does, I'm not trying to sell you, but I'm saying one example is, there's like, yes, you can use Jenkins, um, and you would need to provide all of your own security uh, testing and all of this other stuff. CloudBees actually has a, uh, for example, has a, a this uh, Red Hat's the same kind of thing, where they, they say, we provide a certain set of known uh, uh, components that have been tested together and are, and, and achieve this level of uh, stability and so on and so forth. So you can, you can depend on this because you know that we've put the time in to test it and make sure that it's stable. Right. Jenkins is a good example where right now it's included in OpenStack and OpenShift and it's like the banks are using those. And at what point do the banks buy in? I'm not sure, but I think you're right. You just got to, you probably start small. Right. And it'll grow. And the trust will come. Mm -hmm. All right. Well. Thank you. I have another question. Uh, I guess we're over time. Are we on the same? Oh, well, I hope not. So, 